Ruchma Boim. Thank you very much for coming, and again, welcome to our home and uh, the new normal. This week, in my thoughts, I thought we'd discuss a, an important uh, topic called peer pressure. Again, I think something that affects most people. You know, they tell a story about a reporter <clears throat> who was sent to interview a woman who was celebrating her 103rd birthday. The reporter asked her, what were some of the benefits of reaching such an old age? She smiled and she said to him that peer pressure was no longer a big problem. You know, the Rambam Maimonides, a 12th century luminary, wrote in the first Mishnah, in the chapter 6 of Hilchus Deot, The Path of the World, he wrote, it's natural for a man's character and actions to be influenced by his friends and associates and for him to follow the local norms of behavior. Therefore, he should associate with the righteous and be constantly in the company of the wise so as to learn from their actions. Conversely, he should keep away from the wicked who walk in darkness so as not to learn from their evil ways. As Shlomo Amela, King Solomon, wrote in the book of Proverbs 13, 20. He who walks with the wise will become wise, while one who associated with the fools will suffer. It's also stated in Pirkei Avot, chapter 1, Mishnah 4, let your house be a meeting place for the wise. You know, who we are is many times judged by who we associate with. Who are our friends? There's a story told in the Talmud of a great sage, his name was Reish Lakish. Reish Lakish was originally a highway robber, and he became a great Torah sage. The Talmud states that if you saw Reish Lakish talking to someone in the street, that person can be trusted to borrow money without a note of indebtedness. Why? Because Reish Lakish and his past, he was able to ascertain who a person really was. He understood the lowest of people, since they had been his peers in the past. You know, we can trace peer pressure and its negative consequences by looking into the five books of the Torah. Again, our instruction manual. At the dawn of creation, the world was cast into sin by Chava, the first woman, associating with the serpent. That relationship brought death to the world, peer pressure. In the first book of Torah, the book of Genesis, Bereshit. In the portion of Vayera, 21.10, it states that Sarah said to her husband Avram, Gorash ha'ama hazos Drive away this slave woman together with her son. What was her concern? And the answer, she was afraid that Yishmoel, hug her son, would be a negative influence on her son, Yitzchak. She was wise enough to protect her son from Yisrael's negative peer pressure. So she had Avram drive them from her house. And in verse number 12, we see that God tells Avram, All that Sarah has told you, Shema Bikola, listen to her voice, means listen to her words. God agreed with this concept of peer pressure. Now I believe that the main reason that Yosef was able to be sold into slavery by his brothers was peer pressure. Because in reality, only five brothers, the sons of Leah, hated Yosef. The sons of the concubines, of Bila and Zilpah, already had a secondary status. So they felt the peer pressure from the primary brothers, the sons of Leah. The sons of Bila and Zilpah did not hate Yosef. They really didn't have the same issues with him. In fact, the commentaries say that growing up, actually Yosef spent much of his time with his brothers who were born to Bill and Zilpah. So these four brothers didn't feel this, that they had the right, though, to protest. And even if they did, they really didn't want to jeopardize their relationship with the primary brothers who were the leaders of the family. Again, peer pressure. The Jewish nation resided in Egypt for 210 years. Jacob, Yaakov, our father, died after living in Egypt for 17 years. Now, in the last portion of the first book of the Torah in Genesis in 47:28, Rashi there states that when Jacob, our father, died, the eyes 
and the hearts of Israel were closed because of the affliction of the bondage which the Egyptians began to enslave them. That's strange. Because Rabbeinu Bachai states that the enslavement of the children of Israel did not begin until all the brothers died. So how are we to reconcile these two so seemingly contradictory statements? In reality, there's no contradiction. When Jacob, our father, died, the spiritual enslavement of the Jewish people began. It was gradual, peer pressure. You know, no one wants to stick out. We all want to be part of the in crowd. And so, so did they. During the 54 years that Yosef lived after his father's death, he tried to keep his extended family separated from the Egyptian populace. But when he died, the seventh verse in the first chapter of the second book of the Torah in Exodus states that Timale Ha'oretz Osam, and the land was filled with them, which the commentaries translate to mean that they moved in all areas of Egyptian society. They became Egyptian Jews and submitted to their lifestyle. And just like the Egyptians were idol worshippers, so too, eventually, their Jewish servants also became idol worshippers, peer pressure. You know, they tell a story about Peretz Chaim, who lived in Russia during the reign of the communist. He was Fabringen. Fabringen is a Hasidic get-together with food and drink, stories, song. He was there with some other Hasidim in a basement apartment in Russia. You know, the communists did not allow the Jews to congregate for any religious events. And they had been there for a while, and the candles they had lit had burnt out already. But they continued to fabring by the light of the street lamp that was shining outside the basement apartment. Now, it just so happened while they were there that a chassid, another individual, was walking down the street, and he heard them singing. He called out to them, and they said he should join them in their basement apartment. So he decided to take them up on their offer, and he went down to the apartment. Now, the door was open. And so he walked in and then shut the door and closed it behind himself. He took a few steps into the apartment and then he froze. The men who were there asked him why he had stopped moving. <laughs> why he didn't come all the way into the apartment and take a seat. And he told them the apartment was pitch black. He couldn't see anything. So one of the men told him to just wait a minute and your eyes will adjust to the light and you'll be able to see just like us. When Abchain heard these words, he began to cry. And they were all surprised. They asked him, what was he crying about? And he told them that the comment about becoming accustomed to the darkness made him think about how we perceive our exile. We have become so used to the darkness of the exile that to us it has become light. Peer pressure. In the third book of the Torah, in the portion of Bahar 2547, which deals with a Jew who sells himself as a slave to what we call a ger tosha, which is a non-Jew who lives in the land of Israel. In this case, the peer pressure works both ways. Rashi tells us that the reason why this non-Jew is rich is because he bought the imoch, because he has clinged to you. The fact that he chose to live amongst the children of Israel in the land of Israel was his success. On the other hand, what caused a Jew to become poor? And Rashi states, he boko imo, because he clinged, he was clinging with him because he learned from his non-Jewish master's doings, positive for the non-Jew and negative for the Jew, but both, peer pressure. And then in the fourth book of the Torah, in the book of Numbers, in the portion of Korach 16.1, it states that Dustin and Aviram, through the antis of Moshe and Aaron, were part of Korach's rebellion against Moshe. Rashi tells us that because the tribe of Reuven camped next to the family of Korach and his sons on the south side of the camp, they associated themselves with Korach and his rebellion. And Rashi says, woe to the wicked and woe to his neighbor. Negative peer pressure. We see quite the opposite scenario in the first portion of the book of Numbers, 3.38, where the Torah describes for us where Moshe 
his brother Aaron and his sons camped during the 40 years that the Jews traveled in the desert. Now there Rashi says that next to them was the standard of the camp of Judah and those that pitched by him. There were always three tribes. With them, Yehuda was Yisachar and Zavulun. Rashi says, it is well with the righteous and well with his neighbor. Since they were neighbors of Moshe who engaged in the study of Torah, they also became great in Torah, positive peer pressure. And again in the book of the Torah, fourth book of the Torah, in the book of Numbers, at the end of the portion of Bullock, Torah tells us about the incident that took place at Shittim, at the end of the 40 years in the desert. That is where the Midianite women seduced some 200,000 Jewish men. Not only that, they enticed them into serving the idol, Baal Peor. Now, the only way you can get one quarter of the Jewish male population to sin at the same time is through peer pressure. No one likes to sin alone. It's always more fun in a crowd. It even gives the sense, so to speak, a feeling of legitimacy. You know, it almost becomes a mitzvah. You kind of turn it around and say, we're serving God with joy. Now, the book of Psalms, Tehillim, authored by King David, opens up with a warning about peer pressure. Very clear. He begins, Ashri Ha'ish, happy is the man who never walked in the counsel of the wicked, nor stood in the path of the sinner, and in the company of the jesters he has never sat. King David is warning us at the beginning, the introduction to his Psalms, peer pressure is real. Before one does anything else, one should be certain to distance themselves from the wicked, the sinner, and the jester. Don't walk, don't stand, or sit with them. They will have a very negative effect on you. Beware. Peer pressure is very powerful and persuasive. You know, in Pirkei Avot, the Ethics of the Fathers, Chapter 2, Mishnah 10, the Mishnah tells us, Rabbi Yochanan Mizakai, who asked his five illustrious students, what is the proper path that a person should follow? Two of the answers were a good friend and a good neighbor. Now, these two, st two answers connect to positive peer pressure. He then asked them, what is the evil path that a person should keep far away from? Two of the answers are now stated in the negative, a wicked friend and a wicked neighbor. The wicked person is called a friend, someone you have a relationship with, but in reality, one should have no relationship with this so-called friend at all. The end result can only be negative peer pressure. Now, many times, interesting, just being in the company of the wrong people at the wrong time can cause unintended catastrophic results. Okay, that's a friend, but why a wicked neighbor? You have yours, he has his. What's the problem? You would think, right? <laughs> From first-hand experience, I can testify that having a wicked neighbor for 15 years taught me about the wisdom of the sages. Amazing. This was said about 2,000 years ago. Some things never change. In the end, this neighbor brings out negative emotions in you that you don't need and you don't want. But they exist nonetheless. The neighbor has influenced your life. He has forced himself into your mind. Negative peer pressure. Now, you know, I think this can best be understood by a statement that's made in the Talmud. It states that if a person walks into a perfume shop and buys nothing, he still walks out smelling better. The opposite is also true of an outhouse. Peer pressure will define who you are and also how others will perceive you. The problem many times is that we have trouble being able to smell anything negative about ourselves. Every house has a smell. Do you know what yours smells like? I think not. In the fifth book of the Torah, in the book of Devarim, in the portion of Akev, chapter 7, verse number 16, Moshe tells the people, about to enter the land of Canaan. When you consume all the nations that God, the Lord, has given you, do not show them any pity. But why? Simple. Peer pressure. God, who is all-knowing, warned them about the negative influence of the seven nations of Canaan, 
that they would exert on them. They didn't listen. And history has proved the wisdom of God's orders. A price that we are still paying for today. Amputation is never easy, but it has the ability to save the patient life. Now, peer pressure is not limited to people who are our equals. Peer pressure also extends to our leaders. Leaders have their position so as to help hopefully elevate their followers. But it is only on the shoulders of their followers that a leader can soar. We see with Moshe when he was on the mountain receiving the first set of tablets, the luchos. And in his absence, the people made the Zav, the Egel uh, the golden cat. God says to Moshe in the book of Exodus, in the portion of Kisisa 32.7, God says to Moshe, Lech raid, go down, for your people have become corrupt. Rashi comments on these words and says, from your high office go down. I have given you this office only because of them. You know, they tell a story about the holy Baal Shem Tov. He had a custom of standing along a nida, at which time his soul would soar in the heavens. And this took a minute, took a while. And during the prayers, the peasants that had joined them would leave to take care of their business. And the Hasidim, his close students, would stay and wait for him to finish, and then they would finish off the prayers. Just so happened one day, strangely enough, all of the students that were in attendance after the peasants left also felt hungry, and they all decided they would go home, quick, catch a quick bite, and then return, and they knew how long the Baal Shem Tov stood in prayer, so they felt he would, they wouldn't be missed. Sure enough, when they came back, he was standing there waiting for them, and they were very surprised but respectfully, they didn't say anything, and they sent one of the elder, venerable Hasidim, to ask the Baal Shem Tov what had changed that day. And he told the Hasid, he gave him a parable. He said, imagine you had a man who saw a bird, a very exotic and unusual bird, up in the top of a tree, and he wanted to capture the bird. Getting a ladder would take too long, so he told his friends, one should step on the shoulders of each of the other, and then he would climb from one person to the other to reach the top of the tree and grab the bird. Baal Shem Tov says, can you imagine what would have happened if as he was climbing up to grab this bird, the man on the bottom thought, well, I guess my work is done here, and just walked away. They'd have all come crashing down, and the man would not have achieved his goal. Same with me. Every day when I stand in my Amida, my Shmon Esrei, I stand on your shoulders, all the shoulders of my Hasidim. And through that I'm able to soar in the heavenly realms. However, today, when everyone left, I came crashing down. And this becomes the key, that the peer pressure works on both a positive and negative way. But even leaders need the strength, need the influence of all those around them to be able to soar. And I think with that we'll stop here. And then next week when we begin, we'll see how peer pressure translates into the secular world and what a power it is and how it dictates who and what we are and what we do. Again, thank you very much for coming. God bless. Be well. Be safe. Be happy. Be healthy. God should bless you all and your families. Thank you.